Father, I just want to thank you for your grace. just want to thank you for giving us eternal life as a free gift to anyone that will be that will believe what you have to say in your word about your son through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I just want to thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um, Acts 17. Acts 17. Acts 17. Now, in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is in the area of Athens, Greece. Get rid of that off here. Okay, here's, here's a map. This is Italy. Okay, looks like a boot kicking a football, which is Sicily. Okay. This area in here is what we call today Greece. Where Paul's at is right, right in this area down in here. This is somewhere in here is Athens. He's in this location. Now, we've heard of Greek, you know, famous Greek people who are wise and... and uh, Great scholars and such of the name. So during this time, Paul is actually Okay. All right. During this time, these Greek individuals, there's a group of them that are meeting on a place, and the place is called known as Aeropagus. Okay, that's how But there's another way to say it. We would simply call it Mars Hill. Okay? Means the same thing. It's the hill that is 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 possessed by Mars. Alright? So when we're reading this in in Acts 17, I'm going to start here in verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. Here, right here. And receiving commandment unto Silas and Demotheus, for some to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw that the city was given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now a synagogue, I'm just going to put it simply, is a Jewish church. It's, a, it's an assembly of Jewish people that come together, and that's where the words of God are read. Are, are, are read. Okay? Now, it's, very, it, it, it's similar in nature is, is that it's actually to what we have here. So we have a bunch of people gathered together and, and, and what is written in the book is read. The difference in a Jewish synagogue is, is that it, to, it today is that it stops. There is no New Testament in there. So today in the synagogue, they're not reading the New Testament. And the reason why they're not reading the New Testament is that they believe that the New Testament is a lie. That's the big thing of it. They don't believe what the New Testament has to say about Jesus Christ. So they, you know, so they will read the Old Testament, which gives the what to look for in the Messiah, what he would do, the promises of what he would do, and that he was coming. The difference is, is that they don't believe that he came. That's the consistent thing today. But at, and at the time, it was no different in the synagogue, which is what we're going to find out, is, is that the Apostle Paul is presenting in the synagogue that this Jesus feller, he actually is the one that was talked about in the book. 
and that not only he was him that was talked about in the book, but he's the king as the king of Israel, but also that he has been raised from the dead. He was crucified, he was hung up, executed, was buried, and that he was raised from the dead. He is presenting that information and arguing that with them. Now, so there's that group. Then there's the other group of the scholars, okay? And the group of the scholars, he's disputing with them also. Now, one of the locations that they gather together is this location that is known as Mars Hill or Aeropagus. It's the same place. Now, on Mars Hill, in verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. What does it mean to be superstitious? You overly believe something. Okay? Excessively. So they overly... So here's coming a guy that believes in the God of the Bible. Here's a guy that believed that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Here's a guy that believes all that. And he says, you guys are, believe way too much other stuff. You're superstitious. You believe things aren't so. And then he tells them about that. So they actually, in, in this region, they have all these monuments dedicated to all these gods, to all these Greek deities that are known as gods to them. And then he passes by a monument, just has words on it, and it says on it, it says, verse 23, For I passed by and beheld your devotions. And I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. So an altar is, is a location, is a place where sacrifices are placed on. And he says right on it, it says to the unknown God. So it has all these other ones to all these other gods. And then it has the ones that they don't know about. And he says, I'm going to tell you about the one you don't know about. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. So by just them having this altar, he said, you're ignorantly worshiping. People are offering things to this unknown God, and you really don't know him. I'm going to declare him. I'm going to tell you about him. And he begins to describe that he is the creator. He's the one that made all things. And he describes to them is, is that we are his offspring. Come with me to verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of of God, we ought not to think that God is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by any man's device. This God that we have, would you like to read? Would you like to see it? Fantastic. For as much then we are the offspring of God. Okay, and he's using their own things that they have. And he says, you're, you're, you're not, you have, you're worshiping him, but you just don't know him. But what I'm going to tell you is, is that he's not something that's made by man. Verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, the times that you did not know this, God winked at. So literally what God is doing is, is that he's saying, as you were ignorantly worshiping me on this altar to the unknown God, I went, yeah, I get you're trying to do good. I get you're trying it. I see the effort. But now, he says, you need to know who I really am. 
but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. That means to change your mind about it. It's not the God that's just mm -hmm. described on this altar amongst a bunch of other gods. No, it is the God. It's the Creator. You are the offspring of God, and you need to know about Him. You need to go leave being the ignorance, and you need to come being not ignorant. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So they were ignorant. Now they're not going to be ignorant. They've become knowledgeable in it. They're going to know the God of creation who is their God. Here's why. He gives a warning. Verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day. Because somewhere down the line... In the world, he will judge the world. Somewhere down the line, this judgment is going to be an actual, it's going to, it, it, it's going to be that the wrong is going to be brought forth and it's going to be condemned. And it's going to be shown what it really is. And it's going to have great consequences. He says, you need to have this warning because there's great consequences that are coming. So I'm going to let you know about this God. Because God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Okay, you know what a judgment is? Judgment is, is when there's a conclusion and then a sentence over what happened. So if I did something wrong and I was tried before court and the sentence was this penalty, that's what I get. He says you you need to know what the pen, you need to know that this is going to come. He will judge the world in righteousness. It'll be absolutely right. No one will be able to lie their way out of it. No one will be able to, well, maybe he didn't see. Maybe he doesn't know. The evidence will be there. It'll be with righteousness. It'll be what actually is so, rather than what we can prove at this time. Right now, all kinds of people get out of problems in court because of loopholes. Or we don't have a really clear witness. But what this book tells you is that there is a witness. And it's actual and it's true. And it's absolutely right. I can't just tweak it a little bit so I look a little favorable. Well, I really didn't mean that. Or I really wasn't doing that. Baloney. Yes, you were. And that's what you meant. That's what you were doing. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Okay, the assurance that this is going to happen is, is that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Come with me to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to go back up to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay. The wrath of God is revealed. It's being brought forth and shown from heaven against what? All the bad actions. And unrighteousness, which is what's not right. Who actually hold the truth in unrighteousness. You have it. Come with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2. 
Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. Now, what is a Gentile? Anybody know? You know? Non Jew. People of the nations. Okay, so in the synagogue, we have the people of the nation, the Jewish nation. But a Gentile is everything else. Okay? So, uh, what's that? Uncircumcised. Okay? For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, the nations did not have the law of Moses, do by nature the things contained within the law. How about thou shalt not kill? Thou shalt not steal? Thou shalt not bear false witness? How about those things? For when they do the things that are contained in the law, without ever being told they had to, the people of the nations have a standard of right and wrong. I have it. You have it. You know what's right and wrong. We all do. For when the Gentiles, which are the people of the nations, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Why is there a right standard all over the world in every culture you run into? Why does every culture have marriage? And that seems strange. They never had contact with, 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 with my culture, but yet they had marriage. Why does every culture have consequences for lying, stealing, doing bad things? They all do. That's a testimonial. And it says, there's a standard. And when? I'll give you an example. If I take my finger and I point at somebody and I said, you just did that. How many fingers are pointing at me? Three. I point my finger, there's three pointed back at me. That, that's an expression based off of this concept. When I say, you did that, that's wrong. There should be a consequence over that. I've admitted that, that that's wrong and it should be judged and it should be dealt with. Now what happens when I go and do that? I just broke the standard that I acknowledged exists. Follow me on that? So if I said, if I said, that's stealing, that's not yours, give me that back. And then I go take from somebody else. What did I do? I broke the standard that I acknowledge is there. What am I? Guilty. I'm wrong. Guess what? There's a record book. I'm guilty of that. Now, Verse, back up to verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. Nobody gets out of it. Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. You ever felt really guilty over doing something? Yeah. That's your conscience telling you. Verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. 
Okay? So Paul gives this warning in Athens, and he said, listen, you people are way, you believe too much. But here's what you need to believe. You need to believe this. Here's the creator. There is a judgment day, and you need to know about it. He's warning you about it. Now, we, get some, we have some more details about this judgment day, and we're reading about them then. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. Not things that are all out in display, but the secrets. Ooh, 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 ooh. I really don't want anybody to know about the rotten things that I've done. Guess what? It's going to get shown. How do I get out from underneath that? The Notice when we read in verse 16, it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What is my gospel? Now, the word gospel is a message that's brought out that's good news. But it also, but it has, also has the idea of of. God's good news, okay? This is God's good news. So God's good news is not that I'm going to get condemned for what I've done. That's not good news to me. That's terrible news for me. Now, the good news would be of it, the only thing you find it would be is, is that, okay, well, it's going to be dealt with. It's going to get rid of the wrong, okay? But I'm the one that is going to have to deal with it. So that's not really good news for me. I need a good message. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. Think about it. Think about what I'm saying. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So he's telling Timothy in this letter that he's writing to Timothy, he said, you ponder and think about, consider what I'm saying here. Remember. Remember what? That Jesus Christ of the seed of David... Jesus Christ of the lineage of King David, generation after generation after generation of generation of generation, eventually came out. Someone that was of that lineage was raised from the dead according to what? My gospel. Okay. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now, that's the same theme that was told here. He's given assurance to all men that this day is going to happen, and he's raised them from the dead. And he says, here's my good message. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Okay? Come with me back to Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. So Paul said his, his good message is that Jesus Christ, the king, who died, is alive. And he gives a lively hope to you through not some dead person, but through someone that's alive. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. There's no difference between you and me. There's no difference between me and my parents. 
There's no difference in me than the Jew in the synagogue. There's no difference of that. It's just that if I believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, as God said he is, now he does something for me. The good message is, Verse 23, here's the why. For there is no difference. Therefore all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God acknowledges that. He says, you've come short of the glory of God. And I will admit, yes I have, absolutely. I sure have. I've done what I know is wrong and I've done it. I've done things that I've learned later and said, well, that's wrong. Am I guilty? Sure am. So now, if I were going to go to court, I'm, I know I'm guilty. What do I need? I need someone to pay the sentence. If it's a fine, I, 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 I need the whatever it is of value to God. Okay? Now, the problem that I have, I have created for myself and the problem that you create for yourself is, is that you're, you have sin, you're guilty of it. You've done things wrong. Now, so what you need is someone to pay for it instead of you rather than you. Okay. Now the payment that God has asked for, and the only one in which he will take, is that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was crucified. Okay. Okay, a cross. This is a method of torture. Okay. The actual hanging on the cross. There's the penalty. Being suspended there by your arms. Now you can try to pull yourself up to give relief. So your, your feet are pinned. And your hands are pinned in. Okay? So to put pressure on your feet, to relieve the pressure on your arms, incredibly painful, just to get the relief off of them. So then after a little bit, then you relax on them and your arms are stretched and the pain fires through your hands and down your arms and into your body, into your brain, so that you can get the relief of your feet. The only thing, what that simulates is burning. It's like being burned. Except that you're not burning. But you feel like you're burning. And it's back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. There's no comfortable position. It's impossible. And it's a constant struggle, constantly, constantly, constantly. It's a torturous method of death. And what God says is that this man right here went through that. And the Bible testimony of it is, is that it was, he wasn't guilty of anything. He hadn't done anything wrong. Nothing worthy of death. But yet they killed him anyway. Come with me to the book of John, chapter 1. John chapter 1. So I'm going to tell you about a concept in the Old Testament. In the old section of your Bible. Is that in order to have their, uh, their sin paid for, there would be an offering to God. 
at an altar. Okay? An altar isn't a stage that a person stands on. That's what most, a lot of churches say, oh yeah, so-and-so is up on the altar and everything. No, that's not what that is. That's a stage. That's a platform to stand up on. An altar is actually some sort of thing that's built or used and an animal, a dead animal is placed on. Okay? And that animal is placed on, it would be burnt on that altar. Okay? So here would be that there'd be a fire. So that animal was killed near that altar and then placed on that altar to be burnt. Okay? And one of the animals that was used for that was a lamb. Okay? Now why would they take some lamb that all it did its whole life was just eat, go to the bathroom, and go, bah! Didn't do anything other than that, right? Hung out by its family? Didn't do anything to hurt anybody? Never did anything. Never did anything to anybody else, anything that deserves death. And they'd kill it. And then they'd burn it. Why did they do that? The person that brought that lamb to the altar would actually place their hands on the head of that animal. As if basically put it on display and say, I am putting my head, I am putting my guilt upon this animal. Okay? I am placing it on this animal. And then that animal, that animal was actually killed in place of the guilty person who did the crime. Okay? And like I said, people will say, what, what did that lamb do? And the answer is, absolutely nothing. Here's the concept. It's the death of the innocent in place of the guilty. Let's read this. John chapter 1, verse 35. John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and to his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Isn't that interesting? Let's back up here. Back up to verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He didn't know how it was going to look. But the concept is there. Okay? In the Old Testament, so here this animal is killed over here, and the blood was shed over here, and the blood was put on this altar. Okay? And the animal was burnt up in here, thrown in this fire. That's a picture of what Jesus Christ did later. Except he wasn't burnt. It just felt like he was burning. And he did it as an innocent victim. So that you and I, just simply by believing on this, come to Romans chapter 5. End of Romans, end of 4, and beginning of chapter 5. The idea of believing this message that Jesus Christ died for you. Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. 
That's imputing righteousness. That makes you and I declared right in spite of not being right in and of ourselves. I'm mean, back in chapter 4, verse 23. Chapter 4, verse 23. Sorry, Fran. That's okay. Yeah, I said chapter 5. I remember things more by the chapters, whether it's before or middle, beginning, end, and maybe the previous chapter before. That's why. Verse 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. That means God will call you right even though you're not right. Even though what you did is not right. Simply by believing a right statement, a right concept, a right idea that God put forth. If, but there's a condition. Here's the condition. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who did what? Who was delivered for our offenses. Things that I did wrong. And was raised again so that I, for our justification. Now justification I'll say it another way. To be declared right. Okay? The process of being made right. Justification. To, if we could say righteous side, that would be, if that were a word using... We say justification, but it's to be declared righteous. To have righteous put in us, to, to give it to us, to be called it, to be identified with it. In spite of doing the wrong. Okay? The idea of how, how I can be okay before God Almighty... Is, is that it's not that I didn't commit the crime. I did. Not that you didn't commit the crime. You did. The difference between one person going and standing before God is right and the other one being condemned is the difference of whether their sins are paid for or not and whether it's imputed to them. And whether God can call them right or not. So, the other option would be to never do anything wrong. Never have done anything wrong. Never do anything wrong. How's that working for you? Not working for me. Failed a long time ago. In fact, I probably realized it about your age that I did things wrong in spite of trying to do right somewhere in there it dawned on me so I tried the I'm going to do right from here on out made it to the next morning not much long after that After a while of trying that, I came to the conclusion that that's never going to happen with me. Now, now, God in Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Boy, I wish I would have known that back then. Yep, I know I was. I was falling short. And you know what? I knew my parents. My parents fell short too. They did things wrong. They made mistakes. So my con conclusion is, is that I know I do wrong. I've seen my parents do wrong. I've seen my sister do wrong. I've seen other family members do wrong. My conclusion is, without having a Bible to read, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Now I know it's a fact because I can read it today. Okay? But God gave me an option. Do I want to have my sins forgiven? Well, let's think about this. To be declared right, to live in glory, 
to be a joint heir with Christ or to go to hell and pay for my sins in a burning fire? That's a no-brainer. As far as I'm concerned, I'm taking that deal. Chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the believer has peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through what he did, through believing what he did. He died, he was buried, he was put in a tomb. He was resurrected, raised again. Chapter 5, verse 2. By whom also we have access. We have access to God. By faith. Into this grace. Now if a person is, if grace is something that's given that you don't deserve. Okay, payment is something given that's due. But grace is given is something that you don't deserve. I don't deserve to be called right. I don't deserve to have free access to God without penalty. But I got it. Verse 6. So you know... Before I led singing, you know who led the singing here? Grandpa Tim. And one of the times when he was, before that, for whatever reason, he quoted these things. Verse 6. For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. That's you. But God commanded our love toward his love toward us. Verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When I read to you in Acts 17 about God hath appointed a day, in which he will judge the man by that judge the world by that man whom he hath chosen. We're saved from all that. How about this? For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God. Now to be reconciled, that's to be When we have a separation between us and another person, maybe a loved one, maybe a parent, maybe a sibling, maybe a friend, when you come back together, when when everything's all settled and everything's fine, that's when you're reconciled. For if when we were enemies, So we were enemies of God. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We're not enemies anymore. We're brought back to him. Much more being right now currently the believer is reconciled. Okay, you're brought back to God. 
There is, the, the separation is gone. The anger is gone. Much more being reconciled, we are, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, not only so of this future thing, but we also joy in God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the, I'm going to break up the word, at one meant. We were separated, now we have that at one meant, the atonement. We're brought back together. We are meeting at one location. Now the one location that we're meeting at is this. I meet God at the location of this. Okay? Jesus Christ died. I meet God at that. I meet God. He, di he, he buried. I, I, I come back to God on his death. I come back to God on his, his resurrection. This is where we meet this is where it's all okay. This is where my past transgressions, my past sin, my past wrongful doing, and this is where my future sin, my future wrongdoing. When this happened, every single sin of mine was in the future, wasn't it? Every single sin of yours was in the future. This happened a long time ago. You paid for your sins. The ones that you did yesterday and the ones you're likely going to do tomorrow. Chapter 6. Verse 3. Know ye not, don't you know, that's what he's saying, that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, I don't know what you know about what the word baptism means or anything like that. But what he's saying here is that you were put into and totally immersed in this. Into his death. When you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, for, crucified on the cross, that he was buried and then he was resurrected, you were put into that death. I'm going to give you the legal reason why. I have a mortgage on my house. I owe money. Okay? Every month we pay a payment. Back to the bank. If I die tomorrow, do I have to pay that anymore? Nope, I do not. I am relieved of the debt. So guess what? Here's one of the means that I, I am free from this. I have now died. I don't have to pay it anymore because dead people don't have to pay the debt. And then Christ gave you new life. He raised you. He says, okay, you're not obligated to this death. Dead people don't have to have it. And then I resurrected you, so now you're not dead. Okay? Talk about a legal loophole. I'm all for that. So God said, I killed you. You're dead. You've died with him. Don't worry, that's okay. Now you're raised from the dead. Now you're free from the debt that you owe. You don't have that debt. Verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him. Okay, so we've been, it's the same. Jesus Christ was, was buried. It's just as if I were put in the ground as a dead person. I have no obligation to my debt. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
even so we also should walk in newness of life. He said, here's how you, here's what you live in. You're free. For if we have been planted together, okay, that's the believers and Jesus Christ, it's the same as we are all put in the ground. In the likeness of death, so shall we, so, excuse me, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Look at this, verse 6. Knowing that our old man is crucified, the person before I believed, with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Come with me to verse 22. But now, something changed. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. That's our promise. That's what we've been given. The moment you believe that. Once you get to that point, you have an eternal destiny. You can't get out of it. Okay? You didn't put yourself into it. You just believed a message. And it altered from here on out the moment you trusted it. Once a person relies on this to make them right before the God of creation, rather than, I'm a good person, my bad does not overcome my good. I do more good than my bad. So I'm okay before God. I've gotten speeding tickets. The vast majority of the time, I drive the speed limit, much to my annoyance of my wife. Except when I don't, and I got a ticket. So, was I guilty of breaking the law? Yes. I was guilty of breaking the law. Even though 99.99% .99 of the time I don't. But this one time, I did. So what do I want to have? What do I need to have? I need to have the payment to pay for it. The payment to pay for it in any court is not, I've done all these other good things in the past, or I haven't done this thing so many times. That's never the payment in any court. Why on earth would it be the payment in the court of heaven? Why would it be a payment that God would require? When God says easily, here's the payment. Now let's just think about this. How much does that cost you? Didn't cost me a thing. I just freely believed it one day because, you know what? I knew I had no chance without having something else to compensate. No chance. Now, the, the, the Bible says is that the blood of Jesus Christ is what pays the penalty. So, I just simply said, you know what? I'm going to take God at his word. That's what he said. I trust he's the God of the universe. I trust he wrote this down in this book. And I read these words, and this is what he says. He says that we believe. And he says, you know what? He'll make me right without being right in and of myself just simply by 
trusting something that is right that he said trust that that's right didn't cost me a thing to believe that message but it's not without value it cost the death of another person it cost the shedding of blood from some other person so that you could have that free gift. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for that free gift. I just want to thank you for the opportunity. I just want to thank you for your word that you give to us, that you preserve for us. And that you tell us that you're a God of your word and we could trust that word to be right. Trust that in your court. God who cannot lie. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for making it easy to understand. I just want to just thank you for giving us a warning and an opportunity to believe. Amen.